Mr. President, we, we call former presidents Mr. President here in the U.S. Is that the convention in Mexico also? Well, not exactly, but thank you to say that anyway. Well, thank anyway, you, Felipe, Felipe Calderon, may I say to our audience, I don't want to embarrass you, but I've told you personally before, you're a real hero to me because there uh, are not as many leaders around the world of nations that I, uh, as I would like, who have really uh, done great work in addressing the climate crisis. And you, after leaving as after finishing your very successful term, you went on and worked with the United Nations and with some colleagues, developed this new climate economy report. I read that and I was blown away with the seriousness and depth of your work. And if you could just maybe briefly summarize, this is a blueprint for the global economy going forward. And I appreciate your your work, Felipe, if I may use the familiar first name. Uh, just tell us briefly uh, the, the outlines of what you and your colleagues are suggesting. Uh, uh, but thanks for your words, Al. Um, yes, we produce a report uh, coined the New Climate Economy, in which we are demonstrating that it is possible to have better growth and better climate at the same time. So we are fighting the old or the false dilemma that we need to choose either to promote economic growth or to reduce carbon emission. And the way in which we are thinking is there are a lot of measures that are exactly win-win situation, win-win decision for the environment and for the economy. One of them, Al, and, and is uh, explained in the report, is for instance all those measures related with saving energy. We believe that we can foster the economic growth roughly 1.1% per year during the next 20 years and at the same time to reduce in a dramatic way the carbon emission related with the use of energy. Yeah. And it's quite intuitive. For instance, a solar roof in our houses, in my own, in my house as we the Mexicans say, we have with my family solar cells on the roof and we are saving a lot of carbon emissions in the house, and we have a payback in four years about the investment we made. Just and four the years. same for companies, and the same for cities and countries. We can get better economic growth, and we can have less carbon emission reduction, but we need to change three big systems in the next 15 years. The system of cities, in which this is probably model, like Mexico City, it's impossible to continue. We need, to, we need more compact, uh, um, densified cities based on massive transportation system instead of individual vehicles we have so far. Second, we, we need to change the energy. You were talking a lot about that, and thank you for all your expression related with Mexico. And the third one, we need to change the land use system in which we need yeah. to produce better um, and more uh, food in the very same or even less surface in, um, in order to prevent deforestation and, and degradation of the soil. Basic, basically, those are the conclusions of the report. We can get the economic growth we are looking for, and at the same time, we can tackle climate change. Well, it's such a, a great collection of insights, and you focus, as you just said, on the system of cities, uh, on ener the energy system, and the land use system or the land use pattern. Uh, there is increasing yes. attention to ways of enhancing the productivity of agriculture and forestry by looking towards sustainable practices that conserve soil carbon, use precision irrigation, use the modern farming techniques, uh, and the same with forestry. And where cities are, are concerned, you just said yourself, compact cities with better transportation, grids, not this terrible reliance that we have both in the United States and in Mexico on personal vehicles. We're seeing the electrification of the transportation fleet. We need yeah. to accelerate that. And of course, we spent a lot of time already talking about the energy system. But as a successful former president, if you could address uh, an incoming president, and I'm not just talking about uh, our president-elect Donald Trump, but I'm talking about national leaders uh, around the world is there any kind of uh, advice or formula 
that you would give to uh, the leader of a nation who's coming in, confronting this incredible challenge, you were able to cut through some of the complexity and now you have analyzed it very uh, helpfully uh, after your presidency. What advice would you give to a new national leader on this? Well, as you know very well, I'll, there is no uh, secret recipe. But one of the most important measures we need to take is to put in place the right economic incentives to reduce carbon emissions and to move towards the low carbon economy. And the most important probably could be to put some kind of price on carbon emission. It could be a cap and trade system or a market related with green bonds, for instance, or it could be some kind of tax related with emission. But the point is we need to put a price and in all those externalities associated with carbon emission. One example is we believe that using coal, for instance, or using oil imply no cost but if we analyze the impact on, on human health, for instance, health services related with air pollution in Mexico City, if we consider the cost, two, uh, two points of GDP, as you were saying, related with air pollution no. in Mexico City, we, we will discover how expensive it is to use fossil fuel sources. So the most important, I would say, could be pricing carbon. Of course, it implies to withdraw, to, to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, which we in developing countries use a lot. We need to cancel that policy and maybe to substitute them for other support, kind of supports to the poorest families, but not subsidizing pollution, which is exactly what we are doing in several places. Yeah, and the, thank you. Um, the, the issue of fossil fuel subsidies is a major international issue. And actually, it has been a bigger problem in developing and emerging economies than it has been in the advanced developed economies. We have our own problem here. We have massive subsidies for oil, coal, and gas in the U.S. A lot of them are hidden in the tax code uh, and exactly. some in the defense uh, budget. Uh, but in developing countries, the subsidies for petrol, for kerosene, for uh, all kinds of fossil fuels, that's, that is a a difficult political challenge for leaders to take on. But my impression has been in the last couple of years, there has been a surprising amount of positive progress with a lot of developing countries actually trying to take a new approach to phase out those subsidies and recapture the public revenue and use it to improve the quality of life. Have you seen that trend around the world? Yes, indeed. And actually, that is exactly the case in Mexico. Uh, I remember myself when I started to reduce the subsidy for gasoline, for instance, I pay a very high political price. But it was important, not only for public finances, but also and mainly to reduce the carbon emission associated with that. And now there is no subsidy on gasoline. Of course, as you know very well, Mr. Vice President, uh, the price of oil currently is helping a lot, but the important thing is to capture the opportunity associated with this variability in the price of oil and to reduce and cancel fossil fuels related with that and to use that money in a different, in a better way. In particular, for instance, is through the strengthening of public finances or developing other kind of support to poorest families, for instance, conditional cash transfer the so-called program Oportunidades in my own tenure, for instance, for the poorest families, we can use the money in a better way, in a, in a more focused way, more oriented to the persons instead of the commodities itself, instead in favor of the petrol, the gasoline, because at the very end, the richest consumers, the people who have the largest vehicles are using those subsidies completely regressive. On the other hand, the poorest families, they have no cars at all. So uh, it's a crucial issue, and maybe we need to win the political debate, and we need to translate and support for the poorest families, but in a different way, this very uh, negative impact that we have given fossil fuels. But yes, in Mexico and in other countries, we are using this opportunity to change this uh, obsolete system we put in place during, during decades. Now, one of the challenges that many political leaders face 
and it's been true in Mexico, it's certainly true in the United States, is that the, the legacy corporations that have been so powerful and successful in, for example, the oil uh, industry, uh, have resisted some of these changes. And it, it's only human nature, but some of that resistance in, in my country has taken the form of uh, really uh, bad, I would even say unethical efforts to try to fool people into thinking the climate crisis isn't real. And, and now they've spent a lot of money through front groups to say solar and wind is not uh, very promising. Is that just an American problem primarily? Or did you face anything like that in Mexico when you started leading this transition to a sustainable economy? I think it's, it's, it's very, the very same problem, to say the least, but maybe under different perspective. In the case of Mexico, as you know, all, uh, Pemex was until, well, even today, it's a state-owned company, and the interests associated with that are more related with the people managing uh, public finances and, and, uh, and resources for the government. But basically, I can see in several parts of the world this kind of battle. And actually, it's completely familiar uh, that, uh, to, for us that this false debate about climate change is in very important part generated by vested interests. Yeah. And I remember you, because you, you are my hero <laughs> instead of the other way around. I remember one of the examples I hear you in your marvelous speeches. Um, it was like that. It's in, in the 60s or the, in the 50s, the tobacco companies were paying a lot of advertising with uh, actors and uh, actresses <laughs> Uh, uh, dress as medical doctors saying there is no evidence that tobacco could cancer <laughs> could could cause cancer or any other disease. There is no scientific evidence. But of course, it's some kind of uh, 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 battle against science, and yeah. this is the same now with climate change. Of course, science has rested its case. It's clear from the perspective of of science. Most of the scientific in the world, uh, overwhelming 96 percent of the most respected scientists, has have declared that is of course climate change is associated with human behavior. But even today, at top level in businesses and even in politics, there are a lot of people saying no. That is not true, there is no scientific evidence, and blah, blah, blah. And of course, there are a lot of vested interests blocking the action we need to take. So the point for us is, for the Commission, for instance, we don't want to be trapped in this debate, which is almost a religious debate. It's a religious debate because now it's reduced the debate that do you believe in climate change or do you don't believe in climate change? It's not a question to believe or not. It's science. Yeah. But let alone the, the, the scientific debate is completely clear. Talk about the, the chances, the economic opportunities. And the, the positive thing of the report we produce is we are not talking only of the threatness associated with climate change in the future. Of course, there are a lot of risks that uh, people know better than before. But we are talking in our reports about the economic opportunities. We are trying to tell the people right to business community, you can make profits yeah. doing the right thing. We are talking to the consumer, you can save money doing the right thing. You can get real value and yeah. profits in your own house or real estate, uh, retrofitting your building or whatever, if you do the right thing. You can do well by doing, by doing right. Well, you summarized it well. I'm so grateful for you appearing. Uh, and you could summarize it by saying money talks and with the new profit opportunities, uh, that's a powerful message. And Mother Nature is screaming with these extreme weather events and the combination is really bringing to an end this false debate of, about the reality of the climate crisis. And thanks to, to your leadership and some of your colleagues around the world, the entire world is moving rapidly now. So I, I wanna close by again expressing my deep respect uh, for you, Felipe. Uh, I want to honor your work, and I want to thank you for joining us for 24 Hours of Reality. Gracias. On the contrary, Al, thank you for this opportunity. Gracias. And thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your courage of fighting in order to transform the public opinion around the world. 
you are one of the most important people in this during several years and we believe in you and we follow you and you can count on me and a lot of Mexican people to, to, to give this fight, to battle this battle uh, with a lot of courage. Thank you for your example, R. Thank you so much. Thank you.